Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you join us today from uh, Kenya or East Africa, and welcome to this first EADI virtual dialogue for 2021. My name is Basil, and I work at the EADI Secretariat in Bonn in Germany. We are the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes, and we work in improving the visibility of development studies throughout Europe and promoting cooperation between members across countries. You can check for other events and virtual dialogues that we organize on our website. I have put the link here in the chat for you to see. And you can also sign up for our newsletter if you want to be updated every two weeks about what we do and the events we organize. Today's speaker is Professor Onditi who is head of the School of International Relations and Diplomacy at Riyari University in Kenya. Dr. Onditi is also a distinguished uh, professor at the Institute of Intelligence Systems in South Africa at the University of Johannesburg. In 2019, he was recipient of the IASI Fellowship, which is awarded by the Human Science Research Council in South Africa for all his work and research on positioning African states in the dynamic global system. He is a widely published author and has an extensive publication record with over 60 research papers in peer reviewed journals, more than 15 book chapters um, in edited volumes and books. And he has also co-authored or co-edited three books in the area of African conflict and institutional evolution theory, which is his field of specialization. His current pre-professoral research focuses on exploring the analytical conception of the closeness centrality and its implication for theory of interactivities for enhancing understanding of the process of conflict excavators and extractives with the aim of providing an explanation of the intrinsic character and interaction among human beings, communities and states as a process of diffusion of power, conflict reversals and peace interlocutors. The talk today will last for about 25 minutes and will be then followed by about 30 minutes Q&A and question session. I will now leave the floor to our speaker, Professor Onditi. So over to you, Francis, you can share your screen and thanks again for giving a, a talk with us today. Thank you very much, Basil and uh, the entire team for giving us this opportunity, I will try to remain within the stipulated time so that uh, we, we have more time for questions and response. Before I get into the subject of our discussion today, I also want to thank you EIDI, particularly Basil for organizing this and also recognizing, you know, emerging researchers, uh, you know, cross discipline, uh, you know, cross discipline plenary in nature so that uh, uh, we can be able to learn from each other uh, moving forward. This uh, particular study, you know, was a joint collaborative effort. As you can see from the screen, it's very interdisciplinary indeed. Even though I was leading the study, we've got uh, colleagues from, um, you know, our medical field, we've got uh, colleagues from uh, political science and and of course, myself from international relations, my area of specialization, as Basil says, is peace and conflict, the geography of peace and conflicts. But the purpose behind, or the, the goal of doing this study was really to bring out some of the salient issues that people don't really pay attention to uh, when it comes to disasters or uh, pandemics like the COVID that uh, is still ravaging the world. And so we decided to put our heads together from different disciplinary approaches. And we said, why not? Let's see how much we can contribute to knowledge by trying to conduct uh, some modeling or developing scenarios. But before we develop scenarios, obviously, like any other research, we had to conceptualize the study and really understand what did we want to communicate and what kind of data did we want to communicate to people. And so somebody would ask within the whole environment of COVID, particularly in the global south, what are the key issues? What are the main issues that people are grappling with? There are so many it's not possible we would have studied all of them. Uh, we just decided to have a very small slice of it, which is trying to see how to improve public uh, health intervention through 
of this framework uh, we are trying to develop, uh, of course, borrowing from the social geometry, which is um, a several decades old framework, but we were trying to see whether we can breathe some life in it. So like any other country, Kenya instituted uh, control measures. These control measures uh, were mainly, they were called, uh, or rather they, they were given the name, you know, containment strategy. So the containment strategies uh, involved a number of issues. One of them, of course, being curfew. We had workplace closure. Uh, we had um, isolation and restricted movements. But you will agree with me, not just in Kenya, but all over the world, as much as countries were putting in place those restrictive measures, if you look at the graphs in terms of the transmission, we studied the graphs uh, you know, from South Africa, East Africa, US, and some countries in, the, in, Euro, in Western Europe. But to our surprise, the graphs continued to rise. And we all know, it's almost obvious knowledge that uh, the control measures did not have a lot of impact on transmission of COVID. And so that kind of image or that, that kind of event gave us a lot of appetite to find out more exactly what could be the issue, what is happening, and how much is the public health you know, environment prepared to handle this pandemic. And so we also tried to look at what are some of the assumptions that had been developed in Kenya around the concept of containment strategy. Containment, uh, having defined it already as a closure, workplace closure, you know, uh, you know, isolation, curfews, and the rest. That's how we defined the containment strategy. So there were about four assumptions that were developed in Kenya around the, strat I mean, around the containment strategy. One of them was they assumed that um, the pandemic would equitably apply, or rather the control measures would equitably apply to all the geographies in urban centers without understanding that we have nuances. We've got uh, uh, dynamics, we've got uh, discontinuities within the urban centers. Those discontinuities have a lot to do with the livelihood, the style. It has a lot to do with um, uh, infrastructure facilities and also the movement of people and, and basically the behavior of people. And so the assumption that this containment strategy made was that uh, the, the strategy would apply across. But as we shall see in our study, that might have not been the case because our result showed something totally different. But also another factor or another assumption was that the environmental factors, in this case, the environmental factors being the housing, the connectivity index, and the spatial density was similar. That means across the urban center in Nairobi, those physical factors were similar. Uh, and so they assumed that by controlling the movement of people, people would have some kind of a structured way of life. People would work from home, yet we know that um, the other factors, you know, the livelihood factors, there are people who don't have regular income. They don't have livelihood that is pegged on a particular regular income. And so that posed a very complicated the issue as far as the containment strategy was concerned. But again, another assumption was access to hygiene facilities and livelihood assets and activities were similar across the urban geographies. And then finally, the authorities, especially the, the Ministry of Public Health, also made a very, very outgoing you know, assumption that uh, work from home strategy would apply to most of the countries favorably. Um, in fact, you underline the word favorably. And so when we evaluated these assumptions, we identified a conundrum. There was quite a lot of issues that the strategy would not address in its crafted form. And so the conundrum in this case would be 
what about the access, the access in urban areas, especially access to hygiene facilities? It is so much to do with the class, what we call the social class. And so the slum dwellers don't have a very regular way of life. They exhibit what we call the regular, you know, micro migratory behavior. Now, this irregular migration of people in and outside urban cells had a lot of or would have a lot of negative implication on whether people would observe the rules, uh, the containment rules or not. And of course, consequently, whether we would be able to control the COVID, the spread of COVID, especially in those urban cells or not. And of course, the swing-like behavior, we found out that uh, conceptualization of this study that it would not fit into the containment strategy at all, at all. But that was not really the, 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 the focus of the study because the focus of the study uh, was how do you, you develop a strategy, a public health intervention strategy that is uh, speaking to the realities of urban cells or urban centers among the people who are exhibiting the micro irregular you know migratory behavior uh, because of their unique livelihood but also a lot of scarcity of hygiene facilities in, in those areas and one of the parameters that we were trying to evaluate included the connectivity index uh, connectivity has a lot to do with the infrastructure for example how much distance does somebody travel to access water? And even when they access the water, how many people are competing for that water point? Another aspect, physical feature that we are looking at would be what is the, you know, the spatial density? The spatial density in the sense that, you know, if you are to look at the distance between one person to another, how much would that comply? with the rules of the containment strategy, which is social distancing. And so social distancing seems to have been a very unique concept in the, in the urban cells, because already the population density in those areas, as you can see from this map, it's quite winding. If you look at the map, uh, you realize that the areas that we were focusing our study on the, the the people the par uh, you know the density or the people occupying a particular space is quite winding and so the social distancing or the spatial distancing approach that was being instituted by various countries would obviously not work and especially when you look at it from um, uh, from a he public health perspective the asymptomatic nature of COVID in some areas would pose a bigger risk uh, because then people are not able to observe the social distance. And so we would want to ask ourselves, would we be in a position or would we advise various governments on a design or a configuration that would fit into this swing like uh, behavior of the people so that we don't necessarily have to restrict people within the urban cells, especially in slum areas. We can allow them to move because after all, if you, if you restrict them within a specified a spatial space or a physical space, you would be making it even worse because they would not have hygiene facilities. They would not have space to do social distancing. And, and of course, the indoor air, or the, uh, both the indoor and the outside air, would still be a problem uh, to them. Then the question is, how did we address this question? You know, the question, of course, being, what is an ideal a public health uh, intervention that, that is ideal for, uh, you know, for urban cells, you know, among the population that are exhibiting a swing-like behavior? like the ones we see or observe in Nairobi. So we 
classified our study uh, into three phases. The first phase was to ascertain uh, whether the assumptions that have been established by public health authorities are confirming, or rather they are in conformity with the social distancing that was being put uh, by the authorities. And we used what we call the Google Mobility Report to conduct meta-analysis to establish uh, whether indeed reducing the social distance by a way of containment would reduce transmission. But as you can see from the study, you know, this is just a baseline kind of preliminary that we found that uh, the, the graph continued to, to rise. And so there was no story to tell about the containment strategy vis-a-vis -vis the transmission. The story was in fact just confirming that containment strategy did not control or did not deter transmission of COVID. So then that also gave us some motivation to undertake another level of analysis because we would not stop at that level. That would not give us what we really sought out to establish. We tried to ask ourselves the question, how do people relate to each other? What is the, the human to human relationship, especially in a complex environment, such as the one we are talking about here, you know, the urban areas where, you know, the, the density is quite high, where social distancing is something that you don't even want to institute because it doesn't work, where access to hygiene facilities is also an issue. We wanted to find out how does both horizontal and the vertical relationship between people affect their livelihood? How does that affect their relationship? And finally, how does it help either to prevent the transmission of COVID or how does it escalate the pandemic? And so we borrowed a lot from uh, somebody by the name Donald Black, who did a really tremendous work in 1970s, but his work has been done even up to as late as 2013, where he tries to look at a, a human space or the, uh, the social space in terms of um, how do people relate to each other, uh, you know, vertically and also horizontally, because that would give us a hint as to whether and the, the type of model of social distancing or control measures that would be suitable in, in those areas. But again, as I said earlier, uh, just understanding the human relationship would not be enough or would not be adequate to understand the dynamics of this complex environment. The environment here being the urban slum areas. And also, that would not be adequate or sufficient information to help us maybe design decision-making scenarios or platforms. And so we conducted what we call a pairwise ranking. Now, the pairwise ranking was aimed at helping us to develop the procedures for making decisions, especially in a complex environment, but also in a crisis environment, because we assumed that, or rather we believe that a pandemic such as the one that the world is grappling with COVID-19 is actually a crisis that requires very meticulous thinking and also interventions that would be able to balance between the realities and the theoretical frameworks that exist so in other words, we wanted to take to another level the Donald Black's uh, theoretical framework by trying to test it in a different environment. And in this case, uh, the environment being a very new one to the world, you know, the COVID environment. How does uh, human behavior change 
or how do people relate to each other? How do we use those kind of behavior to design or configure a suitable model um, that can, can be applied for managing disasters and particularly for people uh, making decisions in such complex environment? So what did we find out? There are quite a number of things that, or lessons that we learned out of this study. Um, one of them is that when we did the first phase of the study, we tried to do some, uh, to develop some scenarios and we found out that restricting movement, restricting movement in the sense that where the policy did not allow people in the urban cells to move away from their environment or their space, actually it led to inward swing or rather it led to concentration of people in particular spaces. Now, concentration of people in particular areas is, is not an issue, especially in urban areas. It, is, it, it became an issue because then how do you do the social distancing? How do you ensure that uh, you know, a, a disease such as COVID, which is very respiratory, it doesn't penetrate because if it does, then it could be a disaster. Unfortunately, the government assumption was that when they tell people to work from home, when they tell people not to move anyhow, people would have some kind of structured way of lifestyle. Unfortunately, in urban areas, the irregular migratory movement, which we are calling swing-like movements, did not work or did not fit into that arrangement. And so what emerged out is that, you know, there was quite a lot of concentration in different spaces in urban areas. And these were obviously risky factors uh, to the transmission of the disease. But there is also something else that came into our attention that in fact containment did not reduce the rate of transmission. This is quite obvious, okay? It's quite obvious, but what we found out or something that we thought it is an insight that we can share with colleagues here and also we shared in our paper that was published by the, the European Journal of Development Research is that in fact the containment strategy shifted the hotspot, the transmission hotspot from places of gathering to the community. And to the community, in this case, I don't mean the rural community, but within the urban setting where you've got a, a high density of people. So instead of the containment strategy, because the assumption was that it would be able to reduce social distance and then, of course, it prevents transmission, that did not happen. What it did, it was, it shifted uh, you know, people from gatherings because people no longer gathered, but then they concentrated them into the, those slum cells, which again, from a medical perspective, my colleagues uh, from the University of Nairobi, Professor Moses Obimbo, he actually noted in the paper that that would uh, be able to, or rather it would lead to an even higher risk of transmission. because of the nature in terms of what kind of strategy would work in these areas. Are there possibilities that we need perhaps to develop a strategy that is in line with the behavior of the people in urban cells or in urban slum areas? And even if we were to develop such a strategy, how would it be implemented? What are some of these risky factors in the first place? Are there possibilities that in fact, rather than seeing a reduction in uh, exposing people to risks, the opposite would happen? And then we also found out that the major form of coping mechanism, that was quite interesting. The irregular movement formed the, when we did the ranking, we found out that 
it was one of the major coping mechanism among the rural cells or among the rural urban dwellers. Why? Because that, that is the lifeline of people in those areas. One, they don't have regular income. Their livelihood is very much dependent on how the day, whether the sun is set from the west or the east. I mean, I'm just trying to emphasize whether they would be able to get whatever they want for the meal from their relatives or from their kings. And so, the, you know, the issue of coping mechanism rotates around movement. And of course, this movement, as I will explain to you as I conclude later, it, it helps us, it gives us an insight on what kind of mechanism, access mechanism would be required in urban areas. But before I just share with you the, the insight that I've just talked about, you know, what are some of the lessons that emerged out of this study? We, we have quite a number of them, but we, we packaged the three of them for the sake of this presentation. One is, for there to be a successful public health strategy for containing any form of pandemic in future, in urban slums, we must be able to, to redefine access mechanism. The access mechanism, access in this case, we are defining it as a social, but also a physical space that the urban dwellers have for them to, to, to earn a living. It could be food, it could be water, it could be access to roads, it could be the ability to escape from danger, it could also be just the, the happiness that people have. So access, as we defined it in our paper, is not just a physical access. It is a social access, emotional access, but also psychological access for people who live in this urban cells. So any design must consider that factor. But the second learning point that emerged out of our research was that any P PHI, the public health intervention, that is intended to control spread of a pandemic should be both specific in target, but it should also be comprehensive. Because we realize that when certain areas, for example, in the urban areas, they would be able to have facilities for um, hygiene facilities and other access infrastructure. If you don't provide comprehensively for all other areas, then you tend to move or you tend to force the population to move from one point to another. So instead of them spreading so that you reduce social distance, they actually concentrate in a particular area because for them, they follow the livelihood opportunities. And that explains the, this concept of swing like movements, which later on, we coined it as a, a social pendulum from which we developed our insight for future development. And so we must be able to be specific in our design, but also comprehensive to take account of all the dynamics in the urban sex. In other words, we say that in our paper, the authorities and policy analysts and even researchers, they should be able to see the trees, but also the forest. You should not just see the forest, but you should also see the tree. At the same time, if you just focus on the trees without seeing the bigger picture, then you miss the point. You would not be able to design a suitable strategy that would be able to fit our urban centers. And then finally, that is the, the learning point number three, the future PHI uh, strategy should be configured around the phenomena of irregular movements. I think I don't want to overdwell on that. I had already mentioned that because obviously the urban dwellers, their livelihood is so much dependent on day-to-day -day survival. And movement is very, very critical as part of that survival strategy. So what next? <laughs>
uh, somebody would ask the question, what then do we do? I mean, how much can we help the policymakers, bureaucrats, and even uh, future researchers in, in terms of understanding the dynamics of pandemic or disasters in an environment such as the urban centers, as, you know, in slum areas. We developed the idea of a social pendulum for the reason that we've just given. The movement is in, in, in urban centers it is a bit irregular, but then there are three things that when, you are, when one is developing a framework of intervention, would consider one is look at, look at the low risk areas or look at the low risk factors. And the low risk factors in our study showed that it only occurs in circumstances when, when people are allowed to move outside the urban slum cells. If, if you allow people to move or to live their lifestyle, you know, uh, you know, vertically or horizontally within our social geometry, then you, the, the, you are creating an environment of low risk. In other words, there will be enough, not really enough, but people would be able to access facilities, hygiene facilities to be specific. They, they can be able to, the, what we call the connectivity index, will be easened, and even the spatial distance would be easy to implement. If you do the opposite, the result you get is actually escalated risk factors. Poor ventilation, crowded rooms, poor uh, aeration, and of course, you would not be able to control people. In circumstances when you really have to do, for example, what you call the, the surveillance, especially in cases of asymptomatic uh, transmission, you would not be able to achieve that, or public health wouldn't do that, because then they, you've got a lot of crowd. But the second factor within the framework, or the building block for the framework we have envisaged is uh, high risk. Look at the high risk. And in our study, the high risk occurs when people are uh, moving inside the the urban slum cells. And then finally, you must, or the bureaucrats and policymakers must strive to achieve what we are calling the equilibrium. Now, the equilibrium, if you look at the, the image we are trying to depict here, an equilibrium is a compromise between low risk factors and on the extreme side, high risk factors. So the work of the public health official or any interventionist should be to strive to arrive at an equilibrium. Because one, the resources can never be enough to guarantee low risk factors, especially in the South, I mean, in the global South, even in the global North. I mean, resources are insatiable. You can never have plenty. They are always in scarce. And so, the effort should be to arrive at an equilibrium. Now, the question is, how do you arrive at an equilibrium? One, you must understand the, the social relations of people in those areas. You should be able to really appreciate the, the coping mechanisms. In this case, we found out the coping mechanisms predominantly, or the prevalent one is, of course, the movement. So if you don't put into, if you don't factor in move, the irregular movement, then you miss the point. You will not, in fact, mechanically, you will not arrive at an equilibrium because already you will have left what we are calling the, one of the, the factors outside, which is very, very, very important. And so we are suggesting that for any future planning, and even designing, you know, uh, urban slum in, uh, intervention, whether it is a pandemic or any kind of a disaster, we, we must consider this framework. And out of this framework, we, we, we are trying also to develop, a, you know, a theoretical framework 
that can also assist uh, future researchers in conceptualizing studies in what we call complex urban areas. And we hope that can be published also in other platforms when we improve on this framework that I'm just projecting to assist uh, you know, different people in different categories as they do their work, whether they're practitioners, policymakers, bureaucrats, or researchers in their endeavor to provide solutions to humanity. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Anditi, for this very interesting presentation. So what we will do now is that we will open the floor for questions. So I encourage everyone, if you have questions, to please write them in the chat. I will uh, give you a couple of minutes for you to uh, put your thoughts together and maybe write some questions. In the meantime, I will start myself with a question. So the paper was published in AJDR in October 2020. So it's already, be, uh, already been a few months. So I was wondering if you could provide us with an update to begin with on Kenya's strategy since the publication of the paper. Has anything changed? Has the situation evolved? Did policymaker operate any significant uh, shift in policy? Thank you. Yeah, you, you're right, Basil. The paper, it's about, uh, you know, uh, a couple of months since the paper was published. And of course, uh, as you know, for academics, our main aim of publishing the paper is not necessarily for policy absorption, but it's always our objective that the policymakers and practitioners can take up some of the recommendations. Um, however, I would say this. Since we published the paper, we've been making our own observations. One is that, uh, you know, we've not experienced very tremendous increase in transmission in our urban areas, especially slum areas as we thought. And we, we think uh, one of the reasons why that is happening is not necessarily because the government interventions, um, uh, you know, public health interventions, but, but it's just because of the nature of this particular disease. It has a, its own way of uh, transmission, I mean, it, it has its own epidemiological, uh, you know, characteristics which are not necessarily in tandem with public health intervention measures. In fact, what we found out in most cases is that uh, majority of people or majority of areas that are experiencing higher rate of transmission are actually among, uh, you know, middle class and high class population people that you would expect to have knowledge on how to wash their hands, on how to use the, um, you know, this, uh, you know, the, um, the sanitizer, on how to put on the masks, you know, I, I've got mine here, but I don't know how effective it is. You know, the middle class and the high class people, you would expect those are people who have the knowledge, but unfortunately what is happening in Kenya is, is almost, the reverse. I mean, we don't have as many people in urban, in urban slum areas transmitted compared to the middle class or high class areas where we see quite a lot of it. And so one of the advice we are providing to government in another paper that we published, a police paper, would be perhaps is just to intensify a, what we call a differentiated approach so that you've got a different mechanism for middle class, you've got another mechanism of prevention in, in lower class, you know, the so-called the, uh, the peasants. And so if we do that, perhaps we can deal with it in a different way, rather than just having a blanket kind of approach to controlling a pandemic, uh, such as the one that we are experiencing. Thank you very much. We've had um, another question coming in, um, mentioning the fact that the social pendulum that you that you have referred to as an innovative way to design a COVID uh, reaction or mitigation policy in Kenya. So social pendulum as opposed to a containment strategy, which was the previous strategy adopted. So could you give us examples of what exactly would it mean in terms of policy if the local authorities were, were to put 
a strategy based on social pendulum, how would this differ from a strategy based on containment from a practical point of view? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, the social pendulum, I would give an example. The framework is intended to do two things. One, to provide the services to the urban slum dwellers where the services are needed. In other words, you don't, you know, the, the, the current mechanism of access in our urban areas is a bit random. I mean, uh, services are provided according to the planning, you know, to the urban planning that might have been established in 1970s or 1960s. However, from what we see, the behavior of the urban dwellers, especially the slum people, is that they don't stay in the same place, even when they're not going to work. They have a very um, er erratic kind of movement. This movement is, is enables them to access livelihood. So the framework we are developing is actually, we are advising the government that, can you provide water taps even along the way? Don't, don't provide them in areas where they're living, provide, you can, you can, you can design or, you can construct water taps in along the pathways. You can also provide the health facilities in areas where these urban dwellers are going to work, for example, in industrial areas. So you, because these people spend more than eight hours outside where they stay. So if you provide health facilities in a place like Kibera, for example, you, yes, you've got people who remain home, but you know, majority would not benefit because majority of them have gone to look for livelihood wherever they stay. And so are there a future where we can see a governments uh, providing water facilities, health facilities, uh, and other facilities as well, where these people are, rather than where the planners think they're supposed to be located. That is how the framework looks like. And, and, and if you are to give maybe example in terms of the pandemic, you know, uh, rather than making these people to, or, or telling people you work from home, you can, you can devise a method where, you know, the urban dwellers, they can be able to go on with their activities because if you allow them to go and work wherever they work, you are even decongesting. Rather than telling them, I want you to be constricted in the same place, and, and in, in essence, you realize that, in fact, you are increasing their risk exposure or predisposure. So that is how we, we look at it from a theoretical point of view, but also when you translate it in practice, it is basically providing infrastructure and facilities where people are as opposed to following the urban planning frameworks that have existed for many years, yet they don't work. Thank you, yes. So thank you for these details. We have some more questions coming. So for example, we've had a couple of questions on the reliability of the data that is provided by the authorities. So could you say a little bit on whether you think how accurate uh, the data on COVID testing, COVID numbers, the reliability basically of, of public data made available, that and also maybe you could uh, give us a brief update on vaccination status in Kenya. So is there any hope to get vaccination soon in, in poor communities? And if so, how is this going to, to play out? Now, I will begin with the last one. The last one, I may not be, you know, uh, in a position to provide accurate answers um, as to you know, whether we, we have a vaccination plan or a strategy as a country. That is something which is being handled by the Ministry of Public Health or rather the Ministry of Health. I believe they have plans in place. However, I think one of the things that uh, we would be or would be concerning is the, whether there is a plan to prioritize 
people who are more risky or people who are already exposed to risky. So, because that is, that looks like it's the universal, uh, you know, blueprint. Uh, you know, whenever we receive the vaccine, it should be able, first of all, to get to the more risky people, the old, the age, and the children, and the people who have uh, other comorbidities and all that. That would concern any public analyst or a public health analyst. But as to whether the government has a plan or a strategy in place, I would not be in a position to answer that because I believe it is an institution that is well established to, to carry out their mandate. But the second question about data, uh, the reliability of data is um, in two ways. One, of course, for us uh, in our research, we were privileged because one of the researchers is, is, is actually a research scientist with, uh, with the Camry. And so in our own work, we, we, we did not have a problem in accessing you know, the required data in the process of analysis but also in our scenario building. So data can assure our readers that um, we can assure them that the reliability of data was guaranteed at that time. However, in terms of the bigger picture of data generation, like any other country in the world, most of the countries uh, who may not have systems on how to capture data and even disaggregate the data might pose a challenge because, uh, for example, you know, when you are doing the vaccination, we may not even have the data as to how many people need to be prioritized in our vaccination, which geographical areas are even more prevalent or where we've got uh, high cases of um, COVID or, you know, th th that kind of data we have such anecdotes, but I'm not sure we have systems because of COVID is just a, new, a recent phenomenon, but also those things require systems that have been established long before the disaster or the pandemic arrived. So yeah, I, I, would, I would be a bit conservative as to whether we have systems that require capturing of data that would help in decision-making as to who is going to access uh, you know, the, the vaccine fast and which areas are hotspot in terms of transmission. Thank you very much. I've had one more um, private question addressed on the chat saying, uh, asking about the social geometry framework and possible f future uses for other topics in development studies. So you've used the social geometry framework as a novel way to look into the COVID pandemic what, what other kind of problems do you think could be studied with this approach in the broad field of development studies? Oh, oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, in fact, the social geometry framework is, um, is, is a bit wide. I think if you want to do a, a good research and you want to deploy this framework, you've got to identify uh, specific elements that you want to pursue. For example, if you are interested in understanding access, urban access or even rural access to maybe public health facilities or other facilities, I think social geometry is very, it's very good. It can offer you insight on how to measure the relationship between individuals horizontally. For people who are studying power dynamics as an aspect of development, you would find this framework also very useful because in that case, therefore, you will not be looking at a social geometry from horizontal perspective. You'll be looking at it vertically, uh, just as geometry uh, tells us. So you look at it geometry, I mean, geome I mean uh, vertically in terms of what is the relationship between authorities and ordinary people. For example, in urban areas, we found a very interesting phenomena that there are certain groups of people who have a lot of powers in urban areas. You know, they are called organized groups. 
They could be focused on development, they could be focused on security, they could be focused on livelihood, but they are very powerful. They define who accesses which facility, and they are very powerful. They are an informal type of groupings. So if you are studying those kind of phenomena of, of development in urban areas, I would strongly recommend you use uh, social geometry. But also, if uh, for those of you who are studying human relations, for example, if you are interested in looking at a social change, how does a particular intervention change a society or change the dynamics in a community? I think you will look at both vertical and horizontal relationship between different groups of people. The best framework would be the, the social geometry. And I believe you can, it can develop. I mean, it can be developed uh, based on, the, on your discipline, but also the kind of variables that you are investigating in your study. Yeah, so it is not restricted to pandemic. It's very varied. And as I said, we, we are also developing our social pendulum theory. When it's published in a different platform, we, we would be happy also to share with the colleagues in the field so that they can apply it uh, actually in practice, but also in designing studies, especially in, in the global South. Okay, thank you very, very much for these uh, interesting insights and ideas to expand the framework beyond pandemic studies into development, uh, development studies and social sciences in general. We are unfortunately running out of time, so there were a few more questions coming in, but I would encourage everyone who still has questions to either get in touch with the speaker or also look at the paper, which was published open access, so it is downloadable and readable by everyone for free. So once again, I would like to thank you, Dr. Onditi, for participating in this seminar and remind everyone that the seminar will be made available if you would like to watch it again on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks once we have edited it. And um, I would again encourage everyone to check our website for further events and subscribe to our newsletter if you would like to uh, be up to date with um, all our events and everything we do. So thank you so much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great. -bye. Okay.